What up, podheads? Welcome to the Podio Slave Podcast. I'm here with, uh, well, kind of like last week, just just Tone. Hey, hey, man! It's me. Yeah. It's Tone. Uh, it's it's Anthony. Oh no, Anthony's not here. Uh, it's Anthony's... just Nate and Tone again. Maybe again. Maybe yeah, I sucks. don't know. Sorry, oh. guys. Oh, I was on mute. I was on mute the whole last episode. Last week too. Oh shit! Yeah, shit, man! You guys pivoted to the biopics. Yeah. Did you Damn. Did you have any biopics for us that we missed? <laughs> no, that's why I stayed on mute. <laughs> oh, smart, smart. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was in real time, as Nate would say, drink. Drink. Uh, we, we came up with that literally within, like, I don't know, 15 minutes of getting the Zoom going. <laughs> so, Letting the secrets out. The I, I, mean, secret. I think it came out pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I enjoyed the conversation. So, uh, Tuan, how do we do without you? It was good. I. It was good. No, it was good. It was, it was okay. It was <laughs> good, not great. Okay. You're terrible. <laughs> no, I, I really liked it. I mean, I listened through it, obviously, before we put it out, and... Uh, I enjoyed it. I was hoping, Nate, in your last one where you... Who was your last one? Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. I thought you were going to say Zach De La Roca because that would have been mm. oh. badass with the inside out and hard stands come up. I thought that's oh. where you're going. You disappointed me, but <laughs> if we so do what you're saying two, is... <laughs> I can do it. Yeah. Save oh, that yeah. one for round two. Well, here, here's, you know, I'm happy you brought that up, but there is one, there is one thing to go to that, which is the Allison Chain's choice was supposed to be like a 90s kind of scene kind of thing so de la roca are you know rich against the machine would have fallen into that bucket but at the same man, point that's a big ass movie that's, that's, a, big that's, ass that's movie. a reach man you're you're yeah. you're reaching you're trying Nate, to satisfy Nate and me. his 90s og cinematic universe over here <laughs> yeah well that's why that's why it's a nine it's a hbo you know seven year series right it captures everything that would work i would watch yeah. that too i'm not gonna lie then it really wouldn't be focused around Alice in Chains at all. It would just be straight up 1990s music. All right, stop giving HBO ideas. I know. So you were just going to do Planet Earth mu- music. <laughs> head P.E. Uh, yeah, one episode. Do, yeah, head Planet Earth. And you know what? I'm not going to like bring this up ever again, but I'm going to pull a Nate and say, I, you know, I lost my perfect attendance award. I feel bad about missing an episode. Uh, <laughs> but that's the only time I'm going to bring it up. That's it. That yeah. uh, that just leaves me. I'm the only one that hasn't <laughs> missed any time. But, I mean, oh, I'm also without kids, so it's a little easier for me to get here every week than it is you guys right now. That's true. I know. I was, like, pulling my own Band-Aid off, like, many times, just kind of dragging it, like, ah. Mainly because I really was bummed that I wasn't here, but it's okay. Yeah. Oh, we're like still talking said, about it? We're still talking about here we are. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm going back on mute, uh, guys. Yeah. All right. See you, Twan. <laughs> I'll see you uh, next real. week. Episode, <laughs> episode 120. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. So we are back. The three of us are back. We're here to nerdify your ears one more time, uh, and then you know we'll see if we'll, we like it and if we want to do it again next week. All right, I'm back. What's also back is live music. Which you guys, if remember, we did the whole predictions episode. Mm-hmm. I was the mu- live music naysayer and said live music ain't coming back. You guys were like, it's back, and you guys were right. I'll give you your uh, your flowers there. But uh, I think we all. Checked out music, right? This last week? We did. We did. We uh this is about a week after we've all checked some stuff out that you're hearing this. I think uh Twan, you what did you see? You saw Bon Iver? Yep, Bon Iver at uh Thompson's Point, Portland, Maine. Honestly, top five venue. I've only been to two shows there. It's so good. Nice. It's on the water, it's on the four river in Portland, Maine. It's like this little peninsula that's surrounded by water on you know, two of the sides, I guess. It's just, uh, if it's a good night weather-wise, it's just amazing. There's food trucks, there's beer tents. For this show, the weather was absolutely perfect. Vernon, Justin Vernon, like, he's a guy that I would think would be, like, only good in theaters or only good in that's you know, maybe 2,500, 3,000 cap, but no, no, no. He was amazing. He nice. was I, I was telling my wife, I was like, he's a generational talent. Like he's, mm-hmm. he transcends genres. Like I, before the set, I was like, are we going to get any Taylor Swift stuff? Are we going to get some Kanye stuff. What are we going to get? But uh, it was all him. And he did basically something from every era of the band. And I've, I love the Forema album uh, probably the most. And he played regarding stacks, which is mm. my single favorite song of his. And one of my favorite album closers. We'll save that for another episode. But uh, overall, perfect night. You couldn't have asked for a better night. And I mean, what a soundtrack to be 
on the water in Maine in the summer, sun setting, crowds singing along, just perfection, worth every penny. Such a good venue, and I've probably seen five or six, seven shows there now at this point, and it's just, it, it, you described it to a T, if the weather is good, you've got the food trucks, you've got the sun going down over the river, uh, the sky is just gorgeous, and it's just a great spot, a great vibe for really anything that wants to be there musically. And Bon Iver, I would, would say, would be perfect for this venue. So I'm jealous that you got to go because I had tickets to this show when it was supposed to be in 2020. That's true. And yeah. My, yeah, my sister-in-law bought them for uh, myself and uh, my wife, my, my at the time my girlfriend, my fiance actually, and we were going to go for her birthday and- the the show obviously COVID happened and got postponed, got postponed, got canceled. So we got our money back, and then was reannounced for this summer. And uh, you know it sold out quick. <laughs> I didn't didn't uh, have a chance to get tickets to it, but I, I saw some stuff that night too. So it worked out for me. But yeah, man, great venue, Nate. You've seen it. It's a great venue. It's an awesome spot. Great venue. I mean, I, yeah, I checked it out last year with you guys. Kind of like the first Patio Slave reunion concert event at th- uh, to C 311 uh we had peanut on obviously so it was cool to see him on stage and and rocking out and uh I agree it's like you know I'm over here in California now so you know I know it's it's one thing to be biased if you're in the state and you say hey state theater is the best theater in the whole country you know but I actually attest to that and then that venue was my first time being there and uh I fucking loved it and I just remember thinking like it's about time and also it's still so young that this venue has so much room for growth whether it's you know, some stadium seating or different sections, but I kind of like those beginning stages because it's like Meadowbrook circa like 2001, where it's just an open field and there's mm-hmm. no, you know, VIP section. It's just like, hey, this is this is the setup and it's great. So that phase of any new venue is perfect because it's equal opportunity. You don't have to pay extra to get a better seat. You just have to walk up. If you have the balls to to push through, you can get the best seat in the crowd and be rail, you know, it's right in, right in the front. But Bon Iver at a place like that, too, like, holy shit, you know, I saw him out here in L.A. at the YouTube theater, but that's like a state-of-the-art corporate fucking SoCal venue. I'd rather see him at Thompson's Point any day. So that's rad, man. And I, I did see the set list. He played everything I want, that I would want to see. And uh, like you said, Stax, and then you get Perth, and you get Holocene. Like, just those three songs that Ooh, alone is Perth. worth Ooh. worth the ticket price, you know. Played Blood Bank, which is yep. haunting. Just a yep. beautiful song. He's you're right. He's a great voice. I thought of you, Nate, when I was there. Like literally, I thought of you, which is I don't know, kind of a wow. weird uh, way to open this no, up. No, no, that's cool. I, like I thought of you because I'm like, this is like a typical Tuesday night for Nate outside venue in SoCal. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Getting a, getting an act like Bunny Bear, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes and no. I mean, easier said than done. You know, it's, they're, they're always in my phone calendar. That doesn't mean I'm actually there. But yes, no, I know but, what you mean. But Southern California gets them, whereas <laughs> Maine oh, is like them. you get nah. the weather. Yeah. You get yeah. It's just you spoiled prick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. We kidding. this happens in the group text a lot. We're like, oh, yeah, cool, Nate. You get that coming. You get that coming. We get hopefully we get this one thing in July. Oh, we got a cover band? All right, cool. <laughs> if it's any constellation, the Sunshine Tax, like, I'm a- I'm actually paying for those shows even if I don't go to them. So that's, that's true. That one. is true. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Or you can be like me and, and do that same thing, which yeah. is a perfect segue into Tone's show. Right? Oh, man. Yeah, so I, I had a couple shows. I went to... Th- I, this is Tuesday, so we're recording uh, almost a week ago now, and I saw... Frank Turner last night and Spose Saturday night and Friday night. So nice. also... Uh, Potty of Slate podcast guests, correct? Alums. Yeah. Spose is a friend of the pod. I mean, he we, we tweet back and forth. He's he's our boy. He was on episode 29 and episode 82 and 83. And if you want to hear about Spose and his come up, that's 29. If you want to hear about his new album that he put out last year and then us ranking Kanye stuff, that's 82 and 83. So go peep those. And then Frank Turner, who we had on episode 59. I'll start with Spose because... I went to those two shows, Friday night, Saturday night. Tiny little venue in Portland, Maine called Santiki Studios. It is used to be a, a tanning salon, right, on Forest Ave, which is like coming out of the city and holds maybe 120 people, both sold out. Uh, he, Friday night, did the his record, The Audacity, in its entirety with Cam Groves, and that was cool because there was some stuff on there he probably had never played. There was some stuff on there that he wrote fast rappy that he hasn't been able or he can do still but doesn't do a lot of live to that level like you're not going to do six songs in a row like that but he had 
you know, five or six songs in a row on the record like that. So that was fun to hear him pull that off because he did. And then uh, hearing Cam Groves do his stuff was cool. And then uh, Saturday night, he had like a bunch of people from the record that he just put out last fall come through and play with him. Uh, you know, Crucify Aiden, who's a guitar dude from from Maine, who's he's a, he's a stud. Like he he opened and played so much awesome guitar riff solo stuff. I was like, this is this is badass at a rap show. I'm, I'm into this. <laughs> like <laughs> we're a rock pod too, so. Love that stuff. And then uh, he had people come through that were on the record and did some songs with him. And, man, just an all-around great weekend with those two. And then Frank Turner last night was an absolute fucking gem. I told, I texted you guys after the show, top 10 show for me. I, nice. I was like, or is the best fucking venue ever. I love that fucking little tiny little venue. We love the State Theater, too. Don't get me wrong, but it's a little smaller. It's a little newer. The sound is perfect in there. And then I found that spot. If you go back and check our socials, I'm like right behind the soundboard, looking directly at the stage, and the person in front of me had to be four foot ten. It was perfect. I was like, <laughs> I could see everything. So I got a bunch of videos, a bunch of pictures. Go peep our socials from last week. There's an awesome couple of videos of songs from from that night. And man, just a just a blast. It was it was cool to go to three shows in four days. I'm gonna chime in real quick. Where you were at Aura, think of like in a literal sense where that would be in any other venue you'd be floating like in the mm-hmm. air yep 25 30 feet from the venue it's just it just doesn't happen the the layout of that venue allows that to happen and it's elevated it's just a unique experience and uh and <laughs> i had a ticket to that show and couldn't make it so uh yeah it sorry it twist the knife with that social media post i apologize <laughs> yeah. take it down dude well, likewise with the Bon Iver, right? Because you were supposed to go to Bon Iver Tone, so you yeah, guys oh, we're, we're even. Oh, we're even. <laughs> yeah, you're even. It's a break even analysis. Oh, and, and the other thing is, so I get home and I, you know, I had a good time. I watched the end of the Celtics. They lose, whatever. I'm, I'm a little upset. Had a beer, but I'm like, I'm sending. I'm just gonna email Frank these photos that I took because they're fucking perfect and they're right straight on. And he fucking answered me the next day. <laughs> so like, <laughs> that that guy is awesome. He's just an awesome fucking musician. Gets you know that his fans give a shit and he's into that and you know knows how to fucking play a crowd and you know is approachable and accessible too yeah that feedback loop is very much alive and breathing i mean you were at the show we had him on the podcast you still went to the show you still paid for the show and then we still get the correspondence even after the fact so i feel like this podcast has paid dividends with just that alone yep but the asylum which is now what is it called aura aura yep that's a great mention because I've only been there once since the renovation, but I remember loving the asylum and being bummed when I moved to SoCal and thinking, why are they renovating it for the millionth time? Like they've always done little updates here and there, but they actually full on updated it where when you're in that venue, you feel like you're in a different city. It doesn't feel like a Portland venue, mainly Agreed. because yep. the Portland venues feel like, you know, they're just original architecture. That venue, they look, they looked at like a blueprint from like New York City or a major market and I said hey let's let's really step it up let's be the best venue in the state and uh I love the state theater but that's probably the most state-of-the-art venue and that elevated stadium seating is is a big part of that because you don't have a bad seat you know you were lucky tone like you said you had someone that was four foot two in front of you but even if that wasn't the case I think you probably you know maybe would have been fine either way but that is a cheat code being behind the soundboard is you get the geek moment where you're actually you get to see the industry happen in real time drink but also it happens to be the best spot to see the show so anyone that doesn't know that that the is sound that is, is so good and yeah it's a great spot yeah i mean twan is another cheat code for us he texted us to us last night <laughs> so like i'm i'm not the tallest dude i'm not a short dude i'm like five nine five ten right in there and i've always thought about doing this and maybe maybe this is like a common thing the heel razors you know what oh, i'm yeah. talking about mm-hmm. oh yeah yeah is that what the name? What Something they call? like yeah. It's just something you're gonna toss in your the shoe, insoles. right? Yeah, yeah. Like you can get them on Amazon. I've been thinking about getting those for shows. You can add. It says I've looked them up. Two to four inches. I mean, two to four <laughs> inches. I, I'm now the tall dick that's standing in front of the people behind me. You know. And, and, and as you said last night, who couldn't take two to four more inches, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh man, the nerd in me is looking back at old East Bay magazines and thinking, oh, why didn't I just buy? <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I buy strength shoes? Back yeah, those shoes, <laughs> shoes that you're up on your tippy toes and they've got those little platforms. <laughs> Fuck yeah, yeah, the springs. Should have bought those in the 90s. Fuck. What's the actual name of those? Strength shoes. Was that what they were called? I'm 98% sure. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs>
I want it though. Because they like touted, uh, yeah, the like. like they would make you jump. They would add to your vertical, right? That's what it and was. And I was a big, like, I love to, like, try to dunk. Yeah, you're right. Strength shoes. That's the actual brand name. Tuan did love to dunk. I've seen slow-mo videos of him trying to dunk. <laughs> trying is <laughs> emphasis on the trying. You might say he midnight dunks. <laughs> you might. <laughs> Which is a reference to uh, dunking a basketball and not Dunkin' Donuts. Like people right. Think. It does feel like a uh, – yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll leave that alone. <laughs> Dunkin' Midnight. They came out with that coffee to fuck me over. Oh, yeah, man. Those assholes. Uh, I always joked in college. Now we're off the rails, guys. I always joked in college <laughs> that I should have bought stock and dunks because they were regional at the time, and they ended up being a national chain. But man, if I had bought back in two thousand four when I was there every morning on my way to school, when they were better too, uh, yeah, I should have bought stock. Last thing I'll say is, uh, look at the show notes. There's going to be a GoFundMe link to get Nate strength shoes. So <laughs> yeah, please donate please. what you can. We'll take it. Please. Speaking of Nate, who did you see, Nate? You saw somebody too. I saw some. Yeah, we all saw gigs, man. We're back. We're this is paid. To, this podcast is pay to play. We actually we pay so we have shit to talk about. So we're <laughs> losing money hand over That's fist. <laughs> we don't make any money. We we lose money quarterly. Hey, go ahead and click uh, on. Go ahead and click on that uh, help this podcast out <laughs> part at the bottom of the show notes, yeah. please. We just <laughs> want to break take even. Take a penny, a dollar, whatever. We just want to break even, please. Anyways. Yeah, I saw two gigs. Uh, I saw Spoon, which was in my, you know, year so far, records to check out. Uh, They played Belly Up in Solana Beach. Small club, 600 cap, small, tiny club. Talk about it all the time on here. It's a really special place for me, and it's local to where I live. They killed it, man. I haven't seen them since they opened for Weezer in the Fray back in 05, I think. It was a long time ago. Back in Lewiston, right? Yeah, in Lewiston. Great fucking show. They killed it the whole time, and I I guess I it's one of those bands you... I think we talked about it in another episode. Like you kind of forgot about maybe, and then they came around with this new record. And the new record's fantastic, and then you see them live, and you're like, "Oh, well, they're actually like a really tight live band too." So that only helps their cause. And that seems like, you know, it's a speculation that maybe they've just been practicing like crazy behind the scenes because they just they nailed it. They sounded they sounded like the records, you know, really good. And it's just a small place to see that band because the other venues on that tour were. More theater size. This was the only show on that tour that I can think of off, you know, top of my head that was a small club setting and uh, worth every penny. I'd recommend anyone checking out that tour and that record for that matter. Cool to see bands like that still kicking it. I saw another show as well at a venue called Humphreys, which uh, similar to what you were saying, Tuan is an outdoor venue on the water called Humphreys by the Bay. One of my favorite venues in San Diego. It's right by the marina. And it was uh, Amos Lee, who's a fantastic singer-songwriter, kind of folky, really, really good, really, really amazing artist. I've seen him a ton, but he rolled through here, and I surprised my wife. I'm like, hey, let's go check this out, and let's bring our son for the first time, his first show. So we got nice. him a little like, yeah, we got him like these headphones to protect his ears, but um, he's been listening to music this whole time, so he, he's down. Yeah, he's been, on, he's been in production meetings before for us, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He sound-checked <laughs> and everything. Uh, <laughs> I think Amos Lee is and between Amos Lee and Frank Turner and Bon Iver and Spoon and and Spose like it really shows that we really we walk the walk like we actually do check out the shows we don't just like pretend like we like this music we actually <laughs> we actually go see it so hell yeah so we're, we're not posers is what you're saying yeah 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 although poser was a good band too <laughs> <laughs> No, we're not posers. We, you're right. We pay to play, but we pay to play because we love to go to that stuff. Like we would have probably, if we weren't talking about it tonight. We probably would have gone to them anyway. So, yeah, yeah, I, man, I'm I'm jealous of you know, like Amos Lee would be a perfect Thompson's Point show for us. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, I, I could see that happening in the near future. I wouldn't be shocked by that. But yeah, it, it's we do love it. We love the live music, and uh, we're happy that you know this time of year, especially everybody can be outside for a lot of things. Uh, it's, it's great, but I, you know, we'll, we'll, I think we got a few more things coming up this summer that we're going to do hopefully, you know, live as fans and live maybe podcast too. All right. Main segment time. We are going to talk about the one and only green day. When we mentioned green day as a biopic pick for us last week, it was because they were top of mind for me and we were going to do an episode on them last week if it was going to be the three of us. So 
here it is. This is the episode we were going to do last week, and we're going to we're gonna get into some Green Day love and some Green Day, maybe a little bit of well, what were they thinking, all that kind of stuff. Just kind of examine what Green Day has been for the last 30 years, because still, still a band, but been around for a long time. And that's... That's actually a good way to put it because you have the Green Day truthers that respect every part of the legacy. Then there's a camp that just based on maybe the path they've taken have rejected everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you see it's so polarizing. You see, I mean, we're in like punk hardcore of the 90s groups that shun any Green Day mention. It's like, well, hold on a second. Let's (laughs) pump the brakes a little bit. And then there's... You know, the the folks that love everything from Dookie all the way to what? Revolution Radio and yep. what was Uno it? Dos Trey. Yeah. Father of all motherfuckers. The most yeah. recent. Yep. <laughs> so we're going to kind of really kind of dig into that. Like, what's their legacy? How important are they? Because I there's just so much competing and polarizing opinions on it. So mm-hmm. what's a good starting point? Like, where do we start with? Green I think, Day? yeah. Where do we start with them? And then, And I would point you towards episode three. They were one of the first records I, I talked about that night was one of the first records I've ever owned, uh, Dookie. And I went backwards from there as a kid, jumped into Kerplunk, jumped into uh, 1039 or, or 39 Smooth, right? That's what it was. Yep, yep. And then, you know, went from there and just, you know, Insomniac dropped, kept going. Like, was a fan, you know, really paid attention very closely to them until probably after American Idiot. So, you know, 10, 12 years of just loving every little bit of the band. Not hating stuff that came out after that, but not paying as close attention. But Dookie is where it all started for me. I'm sure it's probably similar for you guys. Uh, and they, they, they're a band that they were massive at that time and kind of pointed you in a couple different directions. Like here, you can go a little more heavier punk stuff if you want to, or you can kind of stay in the pop punk realm and live in this world too. And it wouldn't have mattered, wouldn't have hurt for you to be in any of those spots with Green Day and then finding other things from that. Yeah, for me, it was 90, it was 94 too for, for Dukey, but my uncle gave me Kerplunk when I was like eight years old. But I, I think I don't even think I had a CD player. He like gave it to me with a stack of CDs and I was like, sweet. But I, it wasn't until like 94 that I had Dookie. I'm like, I, I know this name. And then looked at my closet and dug out the Kerplunk album. And I was like, nice. And now I actually have a, a boom box as we used to call it <laughs> to put that in and kind of revisit a, an old present. But, um, you know, it's one of those bands where like it's multi-generational. Like my uncle who's in his, you know, sixties gave me that, that CD and here I am getting into the band in 94 and watching them on MTV. So, you know, he was into them before I was. So it just shows that their legacy is multi-generational and um, for that matter, spanned many different styles and, you know, sellout, non-sellout, punk scene, major mainstream, all that, all you want to call it. So um, it's a pretty interesting band and one uh, that is worth a deep dive. Yeah, no, I think I'm right there with you. It was 94. It was Dookie era. It was the basket case video. And we recapped this, I think, in that same episode tone where Mm -hmm. I saw the basket case video. I was actually, I remember I was in my living room with my dad and he was like, I've never seen guitar play that fast. And in hindsight, it really wasn't even that fast. You know what I mean? Right, right. But like Billy Joe was, he was on one in that video and probably literally on one. Yeah, Uh, (laughs) But it was was just new. I mean, when did that album come out? Like what month in 94? April? So I'm like eight, you know, I'm like, (laughs) so that's obviously new to me. And that it's funny. Like when I think about the question, maybe that we're trying to answer with this episode, which is like, what's their legacy, how important they are. I go back and forth, but I I think I like, I kind of default to like very important because that was the start of something very, very new. Like we talk often about Beavis and Butthead and the metal stuff, but I didn't, I didn't explore that. You know what I mean? I never pursued that back then with Green Day. Yeah, I pursued that. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? It was like, all right, well, this is a little more approachable, a little more accessible. And you hear about like the whole Lookout Records and Operation Ivy, you know what I mean? And that was something that you was a little more approachable and achievable than like fucking Crowbar at 10. I don't even know what that is. You know what I mean? (laughs) Right. True. February 1st, 1994 is when Dookie came out. Oh, wow. Winner. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely a record 
for, you know, I was nine, going to be 10 that summer. And it was a record that you're starting to pay attention to, you know, MTV maybe or Beavis and Butthead or then uh, the radio. I think our rock radio station did that. Didn't that start in the summer of 94? Yeah, or 95. Yep. So they, I mean, they get a lot of play there. You know, I'm 11, 10, 11 years old. And Longview is is a song that hits the radio, and it's probably about masturbation. And you're like <laughs> 11, thinking it's the funniest thing ever. Obviously, as a 30 whatever year old now, I'm like, eh. I mean, I, <laughs> I guess smart for for them to do that for to get the kids, you know, chuckling. But now I'm like, all right, cool. But the song still kicks ass. It's a great bass line, and uh, I could listen to it today and be like, yeah, man. I see where this is popular, why this would be popular at that time. You know, When I Come Around, fucking massive song. Basket Case, massive song. Uh, shit, I, they just they put out hit after hit in this time frame, and we're all over MTV and, and rock radio uh, because of it. So they were, you know, very much the culture at that point, and it makes total sense that we would have been impressionable at that age. Yeah, like you said, 94, 95, like I think it's, equally across all three of us maybe that's the year that we really started to pay attention and that record in particular like the album cover is like basically like a where's waldo type illustration right so it's like it's very approachable it's not like some obscure record cover or boring record cover it looks like an old comic you're like all right i'm already interested in that you flip it to the other side there's elmo on someone's shoulders you're like (laughs) what the hell is this shit ernie it's ernie isn't it it's it's Ernie. ernie yeah yeah yeah, Elmo is uh, Greg from Zebra Red. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, so approachable on multiple levels on top of the fact that it was kind of, you know, on TV and on the radio and, you know, perfectly placed. The the placement was was uh, quintessential for us to, to to pay attention and kind of go go from there. So I think Dookie is a great starting point, mainly because, well, that was their breakthrough record, at least on the mainstream. But for us and the, you know, perfect consumer alignment we were you know there from from inception if you really count that as the as the starting point and and you discount everything that came up beforehand but with that said you know what does that legacy beforehand mean they were a true punk band from the bay area exactly yep it's funny we you can't see it but tony has the green day dookie poster in the background oh yeah paying respect 30 years later yeah, 24 by 36 framed. My wife got it for me for my birthday. It's an old, like it's an original from like 94. <laughs> it's so awesome. Nice. Yeah, and I, I, I don't think you can discount that. And I think a lot of people just, time hasn't been, like in the aggregate, hasn't been favorable to them. And I've, I was reading, kind of reading up online a little bit, and there's a school of thought that's like, well, if Green Day didn't happen, the punk, the whole punk 90s punk thing, mainstream thing still would have happened because you had Offspring who right. repped Nitro, you had Rancid repping Epitaph. I disagree. Those, Smash was a smash. Uh, Rancid, Outcome the Wolves was a smash, but it wasn't Dookie. And it wasn't, I don't know, I didn't, again, it could have been age, but I wasn't exploring like their offspring's history and Aronson's history and their record labels and where they came up and regionally. It just was a different, it was different. I think yeah. uh, Green Day had more tentacles. Like it, it just, like you said, rock radio. Like I think yeah. offspring certainly was, Rancid was, but not mainstream like Green Day. No, there weren't a ton of, I mean, Come Out and Play and Self Esteem had videos from Smash, but they weren't, if there was a TRL at that time, you know, Basket Case is is number two, and maybe Come Out and Play hits number ten. Maybe they like they're on the fringe. You know what I mean? Yep. No, this is no knock to Offspring. We we love that record too, but it's a different. It was a different beast. Green Day was a different beast. So what do you think? Like, would it have happened, Nate? Like, do you think the punk explosion of the '90s would have happened if Dookie didn't exist? Um. Yes and no. I think it wouldn't have happened in that sense. I think the timing is just immaculate, and I think the record label knew that. You know, when you have someone like that band, like even optics wise, like you have Billy Joe, who's like a full on punk rocker. It's a great, point. but everyone was dying their hair blonde at that time. They saw him. It was like almost like they needed someone to spearhead this movement, and Green Day was a perfect picture. Like you weren't looking at Dexter Holland, you weren't working, looking at, you know, uh, Tim Armstrong. You're looking at. Uh, Billy Joe Armstrong, who was influenced by Tim Armstrong, which is interesting, you know? 
Wait, are you saying that Eminem's blonde hair came from Green Day? Because, I mean, he's... Yeah. <laughs> he would have been influ- influenced at that point. A different generation, right? It's like the second coming with Eminem. Mm-hmm. But 94, I, th- there, I th- feel like there's, you know, certain years that are, you know, it's switching over to a, a different style of music or a different wave that is not quite a new decade, but it's somewhere in between. So 94 is like that perfect year where like grunge is starting to taper off a little bit because they kind of had their heyday between 1990 and 92. So 93 is an in-between year and the 94 is like a brand new thing. And Green Day just happened to land at that exact uh, point. So to answer your question, yes and no. And then yes, because they were approachable enough. And then no, because there was yeah like you like you said there were so many other bands in the punk rock scene but um didn't capture that kind of relatability that green day was able to capture similar to our legacy with blink 182 which is you know songs that you probably wrote down in your diary but they actually made songs out of them and you're like oh i can relate to this whether it's you know autobiography or not like it's it's subject matter that's you know conducive to my life and pretty much anyone in that same realm so I'd say no, because Green Day is, um, it's hard to look back and say, say it with clear eyes, but otherwise they are a staple to that generation and to our generation in the nineties without Green Day, it would be a, a different scene. Yeah. And I think you're, you're saying that Green Day was influential enough to enough people at this point to push them into those other areas. And Mm -hmm. anybody that tells you, anybody that's a a punk fan um, or found other punk music, you know, around this time or a little later, they, if they told you they didn't like Dookie, they're lying to you. Agreed. (laughs) That's yeah. So many people do that though, right? They will lie to you. They'll, they'll shit on green day because they've done other things since they're full of shit. I completely agree with you. So we, we embrace it here. We love them. Uh, But Man, if they're if they're gonna tell you that yeah you know that this isn't real punk, okay, fine. This was mainstream, certainly, but it probably got you into some of the shit you love today that may be a little bit more underground or a little bit more you know hardcore punk or whatever. I, I think a lot of it, a lot of bands owe the debt to Green Day. You know what? The more we talk about this, the more I think we do need that biopic because and maybe yeah. this is a well known story. And I just don't know it, but I don't know. I'd love to know like that transition from Kerplunk, the lookout days to reprise. Like, how did that happen? Like, you can't fault necessarily, you can't fault Green Day for that. Like, obviously, they're going to take that plunge. Like, this is context. I always say it's context is key. It's early 90s. Like, you're, you've kind of outgrown the, the Bay Area scene, right? You're going to mm-hmm. take that leap. And man, they nailed it, but you can't, discount one where they came from and you can't fault them for taking that leap. Right. Yep. Well, and that, those first two records, the 39 smooth and then Kerplunk, there's a, there's a clear like maturity through them from the start to, to get to Dookie. And there are songs on 39 smooth that are written by 16 year olds or 15 year olds and they fit that. And then there are songs on Kerplunk that, they end up, you know, putting on Dookie, like Welcome to Paradise, yep. uh, because of how more grown up that song is and a little bit more like I'm finding myself and I'm not that 15 year old anymore. I'm now, you know, 19 or 20 and I'm a little more of an adult. I have a little more of an adult headspace. So you can feel them grow through that too, to get to the point where you're going to put out this major label uh, record that you know, millions of people are going to own and, you know, people like me are going to have the poster on the wall still in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there. I mean, also like when you're, when you think about, you try to get into their shoes, it's not like, especially coming from those two lookout records, it's not like they get a major label contract with a pre reprise and they're like, okay, let's just write hits now. Like, it's not how it works. Like you're still writing music for the sake of writing music. you still came from that scene. You don't just like, discount that and all of a sudden you're like you came from like the outskirts of the bay area and now you own a mansion in in san francisco proper like no like they are straight up you know punk punk rockers from from the scene so the record just happened to be well received and the songs are well written but that doesn't mean it was there was some like you know different formula i, I feel like like and, that, and i think welcome to paradise it definitely highlights that that it's a carryover from the record beforehand so 
we couldn't be really or more organic than that. And additionally, like, it's not like they were like, uh, visually ap appealing. Like they looked like Billy Joe still has crooked teeth. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. So, uh, what do you want from them? Mainstream or not? Like it was just, it just happened to cross over. And at the end of the day, you have to also think, and I think we're older now, so we can appreciate this now more than ever, which is, you know, you have to make a living at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. So like, do you want to sign a contract or do you want to play 200 cap rooms and like, you know, share driving duties to the next stop? Like eventually, like if you can make a living out of it and, and still do what you love and actually right from the heart, like I think they've done that. And I think that's, you know, dookie in, it, in, a, in a nutshell. And what you just said is like, it kind of goes where my head is. It's like, well, how else would this have played out? Or how else could this have played out? I mean, think about at what point in their trajectory were they a stadium band? Like, was it American Idiot or was it before? Like, at what point were they selling out 10,000 cap venues? Man, it's, it's probably around American Idiot, honestly. And they probably could have done it in the dookie time frame, but it wouldn't have been for very long. Because yeah. then, like, Insomniac comes out, we all ride for Insomniac. We all might... Even, you know, gun to head tell you we like Insomniac better as yeah, far as music agreed. goes. But <laughs> then you get Nimrod, then you get Warning, and I love pieces of both of those records, but they, they started to tail off, right? They started to not be as popular as they were at the height of the Dookie Insomniac, and even in, into Nimrod. They probably hit that stadium peak with, with American Idiot and the yeah. tours for that. Huh. Well, uh, like the reason I bring all that up is you hit this massive commercial success with Dookie. You follow it up, clearly trying to almost go back to your roots. Like Insomniac is louder, more aggressive. Nimrod leans into, you know, uh, senior year song with yep. uh, Time of Your Life. And then more, uh, Warning is more of like a pop record, right? Yep. And then they go full whatever with American Idiot. And, and I'll be frank, beyond American Idiot, I couldn't really tell you much about but I will defend them. I'm I'm a Green Day truther. There's no other direction. What do you come like? Here's the reality: you you put out American Idiot in 2004. What do you come back with another Insomniac? Everyone will be like, "Well, that's forced." You know what I mean? Right. That's you're yeah. trying to relive the past. There's no other direction they could have been in, and that's why, like, when I think about their legacy, it's like, well, it's a very important legacy, especially if you're a millennial and maybe the like the. I don't know if you're between the ages of what, like 35 to 45. Yeah. Yep. If you don't recognize their importance, I think you're a fraud. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think you're you're trying to be, you know, a little too cool for school. And you don't even have to like the direction that American Idiot took them. But if you like music, American Idiot is a masterpiece. Yeah. Like it's a great record. Uh, do I come back to it all the time? No, I probably would rather put Dookie on if I had to pick or Insomniac on if I had to pick. But there are songs on American Idiot and there are moments on American Idiot that not many punk bands or, or pop punk bands from their generation or ilk could ever pull off. And the fact that they pulled them off, you know, Jesus of Suburbia, uh, Holiday, uh, they went a little politically charged with some stuff, which, hey, at the time it made sense. And there's always going to be that, especially with punk. And they, they lean into that, but they like did it on this grandiose scale that I'm not sure a lot of bands could do. And then they pulled it off and obviously were massive again, you know, 10 years after Dookie. Yeah, I think there was a almost like a band meeting or kind of sit down between band and maybe band and management or maybe just band. Like, you know, what are we going to do here? Are we going to be corn and just write the same record every year and stay true to our roots in air quotes? But does that really work? Does that work for the fan? Does it work for the band? Are you really being truthful in what you're what you're writing about? You have to grow up, right? Like, I love Insomniac, probably my favorite record, but am I 16? <laughs> no, right? I'm in my late 30s, so something like American Idiot going forward makes sense. If I was in the band, I would be like, hey, this is probably the direction we want to go, so we're at least writing something that is, you know, happening. You know, rather than something that I'm reflect, like I'm literally digging through shoeboxes with old notes, like, oh, I guess I could write this because it, it reflects what, you know, sold records. But, you know, we all see through that. So it doesn't really work. So I think they made the right choice. And it's weird saying it now because I remember with American Idiot, I was initially kind of disappointed. But then I, you know, gave the record some time and saw them live and realized 
okay, this is just a different phase of the band and um, was a very conscious choice. I mean, like literally they wore like, you know, almost like a stage setup outfit. Everything was like mirrored to like this new style and phase of the band. Yeah. So it was very conscious, right? It wasn't just like, oh, let's try this out. Like it was like, hey, this is us now. Coming from Warning especially, because Warning was basically optics and everything looked like Dookie. <laughs> it looked like everything looked the same. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's very respectable to your point, Juan. I think it was, you know, what are you, what are you supposed to do? I think this is a, a good choice, even though at the time I was kind of anti. You were anti? Really? I think I was just because I was such a truther for that punk scene because I was still pretty young. I was like, hey, you could keep doing the Dookie thing, but realistically yeah, but they, I they'd wasn't. they already kind of gone away from that with Warning. With like, Warning, yeah. Warning wasn't. And, and a lot of people don't like Warning, and yeah. I think... Is it, I think the song Warning has some of the best lyrical content that Billy Joe has ever written, if you go yeah. listen to that. But it's that song especially. But it, it's it's a, it's it, them dropping off as far as popularity goes. So I can see why you'd be like, give me more of that and not wanting them to do this next logical, not logical step, because a rock opera is not logical, but uh, it worked for them. <laughs> it certainly worked. I, I think you... You both touched upon something that's important, which is in that American Idiot era, that album is very produced. It's very polished. They, The optics of the band is very much like, we're going to wear ties now. We're going to yeah. do eyeliner. But I'll say this, and this is where I, I'm i going to dig my heels in and defend Green Day. They got sued by Dillinger 4, tried and true punk band, for the riff on American Idiot. Wow. The song uh, Double Whiskey, Coke, No Ice. And it's like that same crowd that now rejects them is now offended that they took, you know, the same riff from a tried and true punk band that's mm-hmm. still a punk band. You know what I mean? So it's just like if you kind of see past the optics in the production, I think the spirit's still there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Nate, we saw them twice, and we've talked about this numerous times, on that American Idiot tour. And yeah. It l- lends itself to they were definitely polished and doing the same thing because we saw the same show in yeah, two different true. venues. And we've we've complained about that as fans of music and live music in the past, but it fit for what they were doing with this record. They probably had a plan for how they wanted to do it live, and they said, we're going to do that everywhere, and here it is. And we're doing it this way because it fits our aesthetic, our sound, what we're trying to accomplish with this, you know, piece of work, piece of artwork that was American Idiot, the rock opera. So that, that, that makes sense. That's a good point, actually. You know, now that you mentioned that, it just dawned on me that it was probably like, hey, let's play places like the Cumberland County Civic Center because we're kind of coming back from a big break. This is probably like the rooms we can fill to, holy shit, we could be doing like seven nights here. I guess we should do Gillette Stadium on the mm-hmm. on the second leg and sell that out. Like they really... You know, there was money basically on the table between management and just satisfying the crowd that was willing to go see them. They were like, hey, like, we have actually graduated to stadiums. We didn't even know that was viable, but uh, clearly it is. So let's go for it. So and yeah, it's the same show because they probably didn't even know they were going to be extending to that size. True. uh, Capacity. They were really like, hey, let's for a mass date, let's just do uh, the equivalence to the Worcester Centrum, you know. But oh, shit. uh, Record selling like crazy. People want to see the show. We're not going to do six nights at the Centrum, so we'll just do one at Gillette Stadium, for that matter. And you know, another thing I want to bring up on this this band, but really just this style of music, is it's a really difficult dance because punk is kind of associated with like youth. So like, how do you continue? You know, like yeah, exactly. Yeah, good point. You kind of have to make a decision, and uh, there's only so many bands that can do that in the punk scene. And you think about other bands. I'm a big Pearl Jam. Like their music is timeless because it's it's not specific to like being young like the 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 songs can be young old middle whatever and they kind of carry on kind of like a tom petty but like you know green day or blink 182 or the offspring like at some point you have to kind of make a decision like hey like i'm in my 40s now or 50s like do i really want to you know continue to write about you know missing that high school sweetheart like you have to if you're going to write that song you have to write it in a different style so um they they made they they did that so so uh, after American Idiot, they put out what Twenty uh, First Century Breakdown, yep, and Re- Revolution Radio, 
and Uno Dos and Trey and Father of All, which Tuan mentioned earlier. I like Father of All. Uh, I've listened to it a couple times. It's like 25 minutes long. It's it's pretty easily digestible. I need to listen to it again. It's been a while. I was surprised that I, that I liked what I did, but it's they've not hit that note for me really in quite some time. I think I bought Uno, uh, and I was just like, man, I like this. I think this should just be Uno, Dos, and Trey. Probably should have just been one record. That would have probably been better for them but i get putting a bunch of stuff out we always like we're nerds we want more stuff give us everything so i can't be complaining when that that does actually happen but they they continue to be a band they continue to do the music thing uh for for a lot of people i think they're they're at a point now where they need to find their way again at which i i think they can i think they're definitely talented enough to do so but i'm not sure i'm not sure if it's going to hit the heights that it's hit because they've been fucking massive yeah and and like i said i i i really haven't checked out much after uh american idiot i i think i've skimmed it and i mean i it's just a little too polished for me and you're again it, it's your you're hamstrung by your back catalog we've said that with eminem we've said that with a number of different artists and i would just choose to go back to the earlier stuff but like i said I'm a Green Day truther, so I'll defend the band as a whole. I'll just, realistically, I'll probably choose to listen to the old stuff. Yeah, I, I could probably agree with that. You know, I don't think I've checked out a whole lot. I think when Uno Dos Trey came out, you know, I was down, and then Billy Joe went to rehab, and there was no promotion for the records. There was no tour, so I fell off just as much as the band fell off. It was almost like everything went on hiatus, and I was like, you know, we were talking about shows we went to earlier, like, you got to think like 2012 is when those three records came out. Revolution Radio is 2016. Father of All was 2020. Like, you know, speaking of the shows we went to earlier, I'm checking out things like Amos Lee, Kings of Leon, like completely different styles of music. So like, am I really checking out the newest Green Day record? It's not a disservice to the band. It's just, there's just so much out there that my association with Green Day and their height is Dookie to, I don't guess, American Idiot. And from there I was kind of like, you know, they really, they did it. They could actually retire at American Idiot. And I'm happy they haven't. But at the same time, like, there's just so much out there. You almost get distracted if you're a true music lover. Like, you know, are you really checking out the newest Green Day record when you're checking out, you know, Frank Turner's new record? That's kind of in his peak currently. You know, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to, to juggle. Yep. No, they, they're a band that, you know, they're going to polarize a lot of people. And we're, we were just here to kind of talk about them on the whole and what they meant to us and where we felt they were in different, you know, areas of their existence. And I, I don't think they're done. I, I do. I definitely think that they've got another, you know, American idiot style turn in them. And hopefully I'm right. You never know. Yeah. And it, it's a band that I'll always pay respect to. And like I said, like if it wasn't them, would it have been someone else for me personally? Maybe. You know what I mean? I'm always, I mean, I'm, I'm a music nerd. We dissect everything. We dissect warp Tour compilations to, you know, present day we're digging into Wikipedia. Like we would have probably found our way, but this just, this was like the game genie Yeah. back in the day. You know, I'm, I'm, we're all dating ourselves with that reference, but I think it expedited a world that I maybe would have found a few years later. And it, honestly, it might've not been until Blink-182. Yeah. In like 97, 98 with Dude Ranch. Like, I think it was like a four year, uh, it expedited things for me for about four years or by about four years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, uh, if you want to hear, uh, at least me, Tony, talk a little more about Green Day, I was on with, uh, the Playlist Wars guys. Geez, back, I think it was. They dropped it in January, uh, and I won. I did win that episode, so go back and listen to my playlist uh, of 10 Green Day songs and listen to that episode. It was a lot of fun to record with those guys, and we've had Brian on here, too. So, uh, yeah, uh, hit us up on the socials, at Potty of Slave, on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, anywhere you can find us, we're there, uh, except for Truth Social. I don't think we've made it there yet. Uh <laughs> YouTube page, we got that going. We got Facebook, Potty Slay Podcast, uh, Gmail, Potty Slay Podcast at gmail dot com, and we've uh, we've got some more stuff in the works for you guys. We've been working, grinding behind the scenes on a project that's going to drop in about a month. 
that you guys are going to be pretty stoked on. So uh, really happy to nerd out with you again, guys. And Twan, happy to have you back, man. And well, yeah, let's do this again next week. I'm back, baby. Yeah, big project and maybe, I'm not going to jinx it, but maybe an interview in the, in the next couple of weeks before that project drops. So keep your eyes and ears open and we'll be back. Yep, interviews, projects, nerdery, shows, every, deep dives, you know, we're here for it. So we're going to continue on and uh, it's all good in good faith and good nerdery. So we are here and we'll be here next week. So cheers, nerds. Thanks, NPR Nate, for closing us out. Peace, potheads. <laughs> Cheers, nerds. <laughs> Music is our niche. Niche. <laughs>